that. Uh, okay, so we are recording now. Now I, I, I leave. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah, so, so thanks for the invitation, and and it would be lovely there to, to uh, join you all in person and go for a drink in the staff club afterwards. But um, another time very soon, I hope. Um, okay. So this is a talk about mathematical explanation. So by the very nature of the talk, there's a little bit of mathematics in it, but I, I'm assuming that not everybody wants to dig into the details of that. So I, I'm going to skim across the details of the relevant mathematics and try and give you a flavor of it. And I think, um, you know, hopefully I can, I, I can pull that off, but I'll, I'll present the proofs for, for those who uh, do like to dig into the details. I will flash the proofs up there and you can you can quiz me on them later if you like okay so the, the structure of the talk i'm going to talk about intramathematical explanation i'll say what that is shortly and in particular i'm interested in explanation that drops out of proofs um, and so i will look at a couple of things that people have said about explanatory and non-explanatory proofs and why I think that's not right. And that the problem of understanding explanation in mathematics is much more interesting than, than uh, some of the previous literature uh, suggested. And in the service of trying to push this debate forward, I'm going to look at a couple of different theorems where there are debates about where which, which of the proofs are more explanatory. And then I'll finish up with some uh, rather speculative remarks. I'm sorry, I wish I had something more <laughs> substantial to say, but this, this, despite not being really new, new area for me, I've been working on this for a while, but it's hard to make progress. So I'm still at the stage of making speculative remarks about what we might be looking for as far as explanation in mathematics. And, um, let me just, before I start, say a little bit about even those of you who are not interested in philosophy of mathematics and mathematical explanation, it sounds like a little boutique area. I think it's important more generally because a, a great deal of work in philosophy of science is focused on trying to come up with an account of explanation full stop. You don't want to have a story about explanation that works in chemistry and a different one that works in physics and a different one that works in biology and so forth. So when we talk about scientific explanation, we think of it as one thing. Chemists may appeal to different sorts of things in their explanations, but it's the same kind of thing and explanation that they were using. And indeed, outside of science, we think when we're talking just in a folk way about explaining why someone did what they did or why I'm here or so on and so forth, it sits comfortably with what we think of as scientific explanation. So I won't say a lot about scientific explanation, but many of you will know a lot about that stuff. Um, interventionist accounts, counterfactual accounts, conserved quantity accounts, all these different accounts of explanation in science. And on the face of it, none of them are even starters for mathematics. And yet mathematicians talk about explanation in mathematics. And so if we want an account of explanation, full stop, that works across the board, we really need to think about mathematics. So I'm interested in explanation in mathematics because I'm a philosopher of mathematics. And so it's an interesting problem in and of its own right. But I think um, for those who are interested in explanation more generally, it would be very disappointing to come up with, you know, for instance, a causal account of explanation that works everywhere except for mathematics because mathematics ain't causal, right? So uh, it's worth pausing to think about explanation in mathematics and, and logic as well, actually, but I won't say a great deal about logical explanation, but I think many, much of what I say about mathematics will carry over there because I think it's going to be a problem case for our scientific accounts of explanation. Okay, so that's just by way of trying to get you interested in the topic before I start. So this is my path into this debate, and I think it's fair to say a lot of people's path into this debate about explanation in mathematics. 
indispensability argument is an argument for mathematical realism based on the indispensability of mathematics to science, crudely put. Recently, the debate has turned to, turned to the roles that mathematics plays in science. Basically, what happened, a bunch of people, including Penelope Maddy, Penelope Maddy back, back in the 1990s, pointed out that this crude Quinean indispensability argument was a little bit too crude. Uh, we, don't, we shouldn't be realist about everything that seems indispensable to science, because after all, science seems to indispensably rely on frictionless planes and point masses and all sorts of other things that we don't believe in. So Maddie pointed out you need to be a kind of selective realist about even those things that in, are indispensable to science. So then the debate took, turned to questions about what kinds of roles do the things that we, you know, scientific realists at least, are, are, what sorts of things that scientific realists take to be real and what's the reason for that? It can't just be indispensability. And of course, this leads you very quickly to thinking about inference of the best explanation, you know, arguably the cornerstone of, of uh, realist arguments. So a uh, few people started thinking what happens if mathematics could play an explanatory role in science? That would get it on the right side of the ledger for we mathematical realists at, light, at least. So in particular, if mathematics explains physical phenomena, it's hard to resist a realist reading of the mathematics in question. That was the, that was the thought. And we'll call that extra mathematical explanation. It's mathematics providing explanations for things going on outside of mathematics proper. I just mentioned that because I want to set that aside. I'm not going to say very much about that at all in this talk, at least. Intramathematical explanation, by contrast, is mathematical explanations of mathematical facts. So just to give you one quote, you, not hard to find these kinds of quotes around from mathematicians, but Timothy Gowers, who's a Fields medalist, um, Michael Nelson, point out, quote, for mathematicians, proofs are more than guarantees of truth. They are valued for their explanatory power, and a new proof of a theorem can provide crucial insights. So some philosophers have just simply denied that there is explanation in mathematics because it's all necessary. Once you've proven something, then the theorem follows of necessity from the axioms or whatever else that you're using to prove the theorem. So it follows of necessity. There's, there, there's no room for anything other than, uh, you know, if that's what explanation is, it's just something following necessarily from something else, but there's no special cases, no proof. No proof is sort of privileged over any other, but that's just, runs counter to mathematical practice. Mathematicians do think that some proofs are explanatory and some proofs are not. And indeed, the cases I'm most interested in are cases where you've got some theorem and it has more than one proof and one of the proofs is considered explanatory and the other one is not. Right, so it's not the, 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 the explanation as it were does not rest in the theorem itself, it rests in the proof. Now, I, I'm going to set aside other questions about whether that you can have other kind, other locations for explanation. I, I'm not committed to the view that proofs are the only place where mathematical explanations arise, but I'm going to focus on those today. And just note this quote from Gowers and, and Nielsen. Whatever they're talking about here, explanatory power, it sounds exactly the kind of things philosophers or philosophers of science or indeed scientists would say about uh, um, an, an explanation in science. This is valued for, this theory is valued for its explanatory power, right? It has nothing to do with causal histories, interventions, and at least not obviously anything to do with probability raising. So these are kind of standard accounts you might have for scientific explanations, but because mathematics, if true at all, is true by necessity, probabilities are all one here, right? There can't be any sort of interventions in the usual sense of interventions. You can't intervene in mathematics, although I've done a little bit of work in that direction, uh, suggesting that there's sort of an analog of mathematical interventions. But at least on the face of it, mathematical explanation looks like it's something very different from what philosophers of science generally think about in relation to explanation. So a full count of scientific explanation, I think, 
needs to take into account mathematical explanation. And on the other hand, as a speaking as a philosopher of mathematics now, our account of mathematical explanation needs to sit well with scientific explanation as well. You can't just sort of come up with a theory of mathematical explanation that looks completely alien to scientific explanation. Somehow, you know, the aim, at least the, 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 the hope is that you will be, so have one single account, a monism about explanation. There'll be one single account of explanation that'll work across the board. That may not pan out. Um, and indeed I'll, I'll, show a couple of the reasons why I'm actually losing a little bit of hope in that in that um, in that uh, unified account of explanation but that would be the goal that's what you'd like to be able to do okay so that's where we're hitting so let me just start off with a couple of bit of ground clearing here um, and I and I do this mostly because this will be the first thoughts that some of you might have about this. And they, indeed, these are thoughts that have been articulated by people in the past, and I just think they're on the wrong track. So I just want to clear the, clear the path here. It's been suggested that reductio proofs are unexplanatory. After all, a proof show, uh, these proofs show that P must be true because not P leads to contradiction. On the face of it, that doesn't tell us why P is true. Um, it just tells us, you know, the assumption of P would lead to trouble, you know, worst kind of trouble, contradictions. But there are devils in the details here. So I, I'm not going to go through this proof. This will be familiar to some of you. Um, those who haven't been through it, um, you can do that in your own times so to have a look at this proof. It's a, it's a very cool proof. It's a proof uh, attributed to Euclid that there are infinitely many primes and um, there are various different, different styles of proof, but I'm gonna focus on two very closely related proofs here. So the reductio form of this proof starts out, assume that there is a largest prime, P sub L for being the largest. So now consider the number one greater than the product of all the primes. Okay, so you get this interesting construction, then a bit of fancy footwork in the middle. I won't uh, uh, labor the details there, but you end up with this very clever construction that gets you a prime that's larger than PL. So now just skip down to the last lines of the proof. Um, that tells us that this number is larger than the in initial prime. And so contradiction, because by assumption, PL was the largest prime. We've just constructed one that is larger. So by reductio, there is no largest prime. That's a reductio proof. And according to this story, that should not be explanatory. It's the um, reduct something about the reductio uh, format of the proof that makes it unexplanatory. Why isn't that right? Well, let me give you another proof. And all I need to do for this proof is change the first line. Instead of assuming that there is a largest prime, PL, let me say, let PL be an arbitrary prime. And then exactly the rest, the, the rest of the proof goes through exactly the same. You get the same clever construction to construct a larger prime than any arbitrary prime. So what you end up with, but by the last line of the proof is for any prime, there is a larger prime, i.e. there are infinitely many primes. Now, it just strikes me as extraordinary to think that the first proof is not explanatory because it has the sentence assume that there is the largest prime in the first sentence. And the second one, at least is possibility of being an explanatory proof, simply because it says, let P or be an arbitrary prime and the rest of it is the same. The explanation, if there is, if it, either they're both explanatory or they're both not, I'm inclined to say here. And the explanation rests in the details of the proof, not in the structure of the proof. Um, so it can't be that all and only reductio proofs are unexplanatory. Some direct proofs have the same status as reductio proofs. Moreover, some reductio proofs are explanatory. So this is a kind of silly example, but I think it serves my purpose. Consider a reductio proof of the fact that two is the only even prime number. 
Okay, so you'd start out by saying, assume that there is another even prime number. What would you do? Would you then show that because it's even, it's divisible by two, and therefore it's not prime, and reductio, contradiction, therefore there's no other even prime number. But that tells you why there aren't any even prime no other even prime numbers other than two, right? Because they would be divisible by two. It's trivial, but that's the explanation. That's the reason why there aren't other even prime numbers. So that's a reductio proof, but I think it tells you very clearly why that result holds. So I'm inclined to say there's nothing about reductio proofs in general that makes them unexplanatory. It depends on the deta details of the proof in each case. Another candidate that you sometimes see people suggesting as an unexplanatory proof, what's interesting actually in this debate before it sort of really got going, I think there are th um, some really interesting work being done by Mark Lang and others on this stuff now. But when it first started up, people were just trying to classify proofs, saying you know, reductio proofs, they're not explanatory. Proof by cases, they're not explanatory. Um, inductive proofs, they're not explanatory. But they're mostly just kind of ruling things out and weren't saying anything positive about what an explanatory proof was. They're just trying to rule out cases. And they were ruling out cases by the format of the proof rather than the de details of the proof. So here's another one that people have suggested is uh, are not explanatory. Proof by cases is usually a clumsy brute force method in mathematics. Typically the proposition in question holds in each case for different reasons. So there's no general explanation delivered by the proof. Um, but that's not always the case. You can always take a proof that's not by cases, break it into two cases and do it as a proof by cases. And if the sets the same things going on in each case, then you have got a unified story about what's going on. So again, it's not the structure of the proof. I mean, that wouldn't be the most elegant way of proving something like, say, the intermediate value theorem. So can you consider the intermediate value, intermediate value theorem on the negative reals and now consider it on the, on the positives plus zero and prove it for both cases, right? Um, you could do that. It'd be a clumsy and ugly proof, but there'd be nothing, if it's explanatory, the original proof for all real numbers, it would be explanatory in that case as well. It just would be clumsy. So perhaps proofs that are essentially by cases, and what I mean by that are cases where you have to break the, the theorem up into a number of different cases and there's something different going on in each case. Perhaps they're unexplanatory or at least they're disjunctive explanations or something. But I, I'm suspicious of explanatoriness being tied to the structure of the proof. I'm inclined to think that it's, we need to dig deeper. We need to look at the details of the proofs in each case. Okay, so I, I'm going to talk about a, a couple of theorems, um, one from number theory and one from group theory. So I just flash up the group axioms here to remind those of us who have uh, done a little bit of group theory, those who haven't, don't worry. Um, the basic idea is that a group is a certain kind of structure in mathematics and it has all sorts of applications elsewhere. And there are a bunch of axioms and in order to prove that something is a group, um, you just need to show that the system in question satisfies these axioms. It's closure, associativity, identity, and inverse. Again, I won't, I won't go into the details. Those of you who know this stuff will know it well. Those who don't, it doesn't really matter too much for our purposes here. Um, so just to get a feel for groups, for those who haven't done any group theory, uh, just some examples. We can prove that arithmetic modulo 12 under addition is a group. And the proof is kind of like, you know, week one of a, a, a undergraduate group theory course. You get to prove this by straightforward exercise in using the group axioms. You just show that modular arithmetic under addition satisfies the axioms and therefore is a group. Um, modular arithmetic just you know, think of mod, mod 12 arithmetic is just normal arithmetic, then you divide by 12 and the answer is the remainder. So uh, 10 plus four in mod 12 is 14, 
divide by 12, what's the remainder? Two, right? So it's, the answer is two there. Um, you can then, and this, this is kind of important for the one of the proofs that we're going to look at shortly. We can prove that the hours on a 12 hour clock also form a group. This is again, a kind of canonical example of a group. So the addition of hours is the operation in question. And you can prove that the hours on a 12 hour clock also form a group. So if it's 10 o'clock, four, hour, four hours later, it's 2 p.m., right? Forget about the a.m. p.m. for a minute, just a kind of strict 12 hour clock that just tells you the time. Then 10 o'clock plus four hours is two. And there are a couple of different ways to prove that that system is a group. One is to prove it directly, go back to the axioms and prove that it satisfies the group axioms. The other way is to prove that it's isomorphic to something that you already know is a group. So suppose we've proven that mod arithmetic, uh, arithmetic mod 12 is a group, then all we need to do to prove that the 12 hour clock is uh, with addition of hours is a group is to show that that's isomorphic to modular arithmetic, arithmetic modular 12. There's two quite different, they, 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 in this case, they're very similar because you're so close to first principles here anyway, but it's important for distinction to think about, to prove something is a group, you can go back to first principles, prove that it satisfies the axioms, or you can prove that it's isomorphic to something else that you've already shown to be a group. Okay, so what we're interested in here are going to be cases, uh, theorems from mathematics, where we've got more than one, one, more than one proof of the theorem in question, and one theorem, one proof rather, is explanatory and the other isn't. And just to explain a little of the background here, um, a lot of the debate, early debate on this topic, traded on philosophers' intuitions about this. And, and, I, and I, you know, put me a culpa here, I conclude myself here, a bit of mathematics training, so you feel like you're confident enough to make pronouncements about which proofs are explanatory and which are not. And what tends to happen when philosophers start making judgments like this, firstly, you know, our philosophical views are tainted by, our, sorry, our philosophical intuitions are tainted by our philosophical views about from elsewhere, right? So we're not completely um, clean about this, even if we would like to be. Second is that we tend to pull examples from bits of mathematics that we know and understand, because it's very hard to make any pronouncement about explanatoriness of a proof in a really complicated area of mathematics that you don't know very much about, or you're barely following the proof. You can just follow it line by line, but you're not getting an idea of what's going on. So naturally enough, the philosophers of mathematics that first started into this chose examples that they felt really familiar with. And so a lot of it comes from high school, undergraduate, you know, um, mathematics courses. And that's completely understandable, but it's, it's still a mistake. We want an account of what's going on in mathematics generally. And so two things to say about this. We want the intuitions of mathematicians about which proofs are explanatory and which are not. And we'd like it from a variety of areas in mathematics, not just you know, Euclidean geometry and some sort of simple examples that we philosophers feel comfortable with, number theory and the like. So when I first started on this project, I thought this is gonna be really hard because I, I, can't, I can't rely on my own intuitions. Um, I can, it's a good excuse for me to do a lot more mathematics and dig into some sort of um, you know, uh, more advanced mathematics than I've come across before. That's gonna be good and fun, but I'm not gonna be able to rely on my intuitions there because I don't know the areas very well and I really need the intuitions to mathematician. Problem is, Mathematicians don't talk about this stuff except in the tea room and at the pub. Um, you find the mathematicians are notorious for covering their tracks in their papers. Um, we, we philosophers quite often say, you might be interested, like, as I did, you know, you might be interested in this for this reason. Or I got thinking about this for this reason. We put this stuff in our papers. And I think it's a good thing. It helps you to see where the, the results and the debate sits in a broader landscape. 
mathematicians don't do that. They just start off the paper with, let F be a function that's mapping from blah, 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 blah. <laughs> off they go and they prove this result. And they just don't tell you whether the proof is explanatory, why this proof of a theorem that's already been proven, and there's a lot of that goes on in mathematics journals. This is another proof of such and such theorem by a different method. And they just do it, just give it to you. And you've got to decide whether it's explanatory or it sheds light on something that the other one didn't and so on and so forth. But in the printed, in, so in printed published research papers, mathematicians are very cagey about any of this. But having worked in a mathematics department and go to the pub with them and have morning tea with them, they talk about this stuff all the time. So my first thought was we've got to get mathematicians. I need mathematicians' views about this. I want examples from advanced mathematics with mathematicians' opinions. And I need them to sort of let their hair down, as it were, and you know, say this stuff out loud. So my first thought was get them drunk, right? <laughs> get a bunch of mathematicians, get a few beers into them, then they might start talking. And my postdocs suggested that people behave as if they're drunk um, when they're posting on uh, blog sites and discussion forums. So in the end, we went for something that was slightly cheaper and have less problems with the University Ethics Committee. We posted discussions on uh, various discussion lists and got uh, mathematicians' opinions about these theorems. Okay, so having said all of that, I am now going to take an example from a, a sort of a baby example from elementary number theory just to, to um, get a feel for what's going on. Because in the more complicated example that I'll follow with, it's much the same sort of story. Okay, so uh, this example was suggested to me by uh, Hannes Leitgeb, who has a PhD in mathematics as well as philosophy, so I can count him as a mathematician for these purposes. And he suggested looking at this, the different proofs of Fermat's little theorem. Um, it's a theorem about um, number theory, prime numbers, many different proofs of this theorem. We'll consider just a few, a, a number theory proof, a group theory proof, and a combinatorial proof. Uh, and again, I'm going to just deliberately just skip over the details and kind of give you the, 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 the general story about what's going on in each of these proofs. Um, those who are interested, by all means, dig into them. They're, they're fascinating, the differences in these proofs. So the number theory proof, there it is. You can, you can work through it yourself if you like. Um, what's interesting about this proof is it proves this number theory result by pure number theory methods. Right. And you might think, what's surprising about that? That's, you know, it's a number theory proof. Of course, the method should be purely number theoretic. But that's not all the always the case. There are some notorious cases in number theory where the only known proofs of the result take you into um, complex function theory. And number theorists are not entirely happy with such proofs. Um, not, not entirely clear why they're not happy with these proofs, but they reserve the phrase, uh, an elementary proof to be a proof that proves number theory stuff via number theory methods. And you can kind of think there's a something like an intrinsic virtue about that. It's proving stuff about numbers by just talking about numbers. Anyway, I'm not going to go through the details, but that's what this proof does. Nice little proof. Um, then there's this group theory proof. And what you do here is you, you move up a level. So instead of just thinking about number theory, you think about the structure of the numbers. So rather than sort of properties of individual numbers, as it were, you think about the structural relations amongst the numbers, think about the group that's in the, 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 the group theory, which is this, you know, which is the study of structures and symmetries. So you move up to sort of this group theory level and you can prove the result there. Um, and it relies on a, a footnote there. Um, the theorem relies on a particular theorem from group theory, Lagrange's theorem. That's the key to this Fermat's little theorem in the group theory setting is this more general result. And then, so, so my, my initial feeling was that 
um, the group theory proof was more explanatory. And indeed, that was Hannah's Leitgeb's suggestion as well, with his mathematician hat on, said he always thought the group theory proof was more explanatory than the number theory proof. But when I started digging through them, I thought, actually, it's not a, as clean an example as I would like, because I do think the group theory proof is more general because is more explanatory because it's more general. What it does in effect is show that the number theory proof is a special case of anything that has this structure will have these sorts of properties. But the proofs are very, very similar. Just sort of the language of group theory versus number theory, there's not a lot of difference. Um, you're using something much more general in this case, you're using Lagrange's theorem. In the number theory case, you use a special case, but there's something virtuous about that as well. You're not using anything more powerful than you really need to prove the result. You're not taking a cannon to kill a fly. You're just using a fly swatter in the number theory proof. Here you're using something much more general. So while I do think that the group theory proof is uh, more explanatory because it's more general, but I can, I can see this sort of argument as to why you might think that it actually cuts the other way. So I thought, okay, I need, need a clearer case, something that is definitely not explanatory. So I thought the combinatorial proof, that might be the answer. So I looked at this combinatorial proof. And again, I'm not gonna go through the details, but just read with me the, the, the start of this proof. It's, it's a really cute proof, this. So assume that P is prime and A is a positive integer such that P does not divide A. Suppose we have different colored beads and we wish to make a necklace with P beads in each. First, we place P beads on a string and we note there are A to the P such possibilities of the strings. This is the combinatorics of it. We discard the strings consisting of beads of only one color. That leaves us, and it just goes on with this beautiful story about beads, right? And you get the result out at the end. And I thought, okay, this will be a good example of a non-explanatory proof. But I'm, I'm not even sure about that now. So um, as often happens in philosophy, you start out with some clear intuitions and the deeper you dig in, the more confused you get about this and the more confused your intuitions are. So let me just say a few, a few things about where I stand now on these proofs. So number theory proof has some claim to being explanatory. It explains number theory result in terms of properties of prime numbers. What more could you want? Um, the group theory proof is the more general. It shows that the theorem follows from the more general result, Lagrange's theorem. The combinatorial proof helps build a mental model and is thus pedagogically helpful. And that was re uh, the thought, I think, from the first publication of this proof, which I think was in the 70s, the combinatorial proof. Um, is, here's a kind of good way to get for students to get a picture of what's going on. But the combinatorial proof is also explanatory, I think, in the sense of revealing the real reason that the result holds. After all, the construction of these necklaces and discarding duplicates and the like, which is what the proof relies on, is in a sense just some folk group theory. You know, group theory is not about beads and necklaces, but these beads and necklaces are an instance of a group. So you're using sort of a, a visual tool to picture the sort of symmetries that you have in group theory. So what's going, if the group theory proof is explanatory as indeed I think it is, then uh, it's a bit cleaner and a bit more abstract than the combinatorial proof, it doesn't rely on beads and necklaces, but there's something really helpful about the beads and necklaces. Um, anyone who's interested in teaching this to, stuff to you know, undergraduate students, a much better time conveying why um, the, the, the Fermat's little theorem holds using the beads and necklaces than, than the others, I think. Okay, so take home message is it's complicated, right? I was really hoping for a clean example here and I've got three proofs and I think all have some claim to being explanatory. Um, this is the one we got from the discussion forum. I'd never heard of this result before. Um, it's a major result in advanced um, abstract algebra. And what we were asking the members of the forum to do for us is to give us a theorem 
that had two proofs, at least two proofs. One of the proofs uncontroversially explanatory and the other uncontroversially not explanatory. And someone said, ah, oh, that's easy. The free group theorem, there's a category theory proof of this, which is utterly unexplan uh, unexplanatory. It, it, and in fact, they use the phrase, it magics up the functor in question. It just comes out of nowhere. It proves the result. They're not claiming it's not a proof, just no understanding of what's going on in the, and yet the, um, the group theory proof is perfectly explanatory. So they said, that's easy. There you go. We thought, okay, good. And then someone else entered into the discussion and said, what are you talking about? The, the, group, the group theory proof is awful. It, no one can see what's going on in that. It's only explanatory at the category theory level. So, okay, so there goes our nice clean example <laughs> down the drain there as well. But then the debate erupted. There were people arguing with one another about this. I thought it was just too interesting to leave alone. So we um, decided to, to try and get to the bottom of what's going on in the free group theorem. And I had a couple of postdocs working on this. I gave them each one proof and said, you work on that one, you work on this one. And your task is to be able to explain it to a dummy like me. And um, if you can do that, then obviously you've got an understanding of it and hopefully you can transfer that understanding to me. Anyway, so we spent quite a long time on this, this theorem. Um, the, the basic idea of the theorem, again, the de technical details won't worry. We won't pause on too long here. But the basic idea is you've got some set X and a group is free on that set X if there is some other group for any arbitrary group K with a mapping from X to capital K, the, little, the mapping is little K, um, there is some group that is free, said to be free on X, if you can find an isomorphism from F to K. So effectively to make this diagram commute, you can get from X to F to K, or you can go from X directly to K via that little K function. And the theorem states that for any set X, there is a free group. You can construct a free group that will serve this purpose. Um, there are several proofs. One proceeds by category theory, a similar one, and this is the one we decided to go with rather than the category theory proof. A similar one proceeds by structural relations on other groups. So it's kind of higher level group theory, if you like. You're looking at structural properties of groups, structural relationships to the other groups. Um, and another one, um, 1972 proof by Barr, is a direct proof by way of group theory. And it, just to get a flavor for some of the claims being made about these two different proofs. So we have the group theory proof is preferable because it explains a group theoretic result in terms of group theory. That was the kind of initial reason we got excited about this. We thought, great, there's a clear and mathematician telling us they've got a clear in, in, indication that's the, theory, that's the explanatory proof and the other ones are not. Then we got statements like this. The category for theory proof is preferable because it shows that the free group theorem is just a special case of something more general. And I, I should say the, the, the words preferable being used here in the context of our original question about providing us with explanatory versus unexplanatory proofs, I take that to be not just preferable for other reasons, but preferable with respect to explanatory power, even though they don't talk about explanation in these quotes, given the original question and why we should prefer one proof over the other, it's to do with explanation in this context. It's been some very interesting work lately, actually, on mathematicians talk of beauty and simplicity and all the virtues that they see in various proofs and how well or how unwell, as the case may be, they line up with explanatory power. And that's a whole other interesting story, but here I'm pretty confident to read that preferable as preferable with respect to explanatory power because of the question we set for them. So um, the constructive proof, as, as it's called, um, and I, for those of you who, you know, like me, 
see constructive and think immediately of um, you know, uh, constructive in the technical sense of intuitionistic logic or constructive logic. That's not what they mean. They, they use this phrase rather confusingly. The proof just means you construct the group in question out of the elements of the set you start with. So you build the thing. It's like building it out of Lego. You call it constructive for that reason, not because you're using constructive methods in the sense of logicians, construction, con constructive methods. Um, so this so-called constructive proof, as I said, builds it from the ground up. The proof has the virtue of being direct, um, doing proving a group theory result using nothing other than group theory and elements of groups. It's tedious and involves several technical tricks to get around the difficulties. In essence, it shows that there's a group, um, there is such a group by constructing the group in question and proving that it satisfies the group axiom. So it really is a kind of like a first principles brute force kind of uh, construction. And the, as I said, some people thought that that was more explanatory because it sort of gave you why this free group exists because of stuff about groups. But the abstract proof is much more complicated and we spent quite a bit more time on this one to really make sure we understood it. But what it does, um, compare back to the original diagram here, right? This is what you want to show is that this diagram commutes. You've got the, some set X, a mapping from X to capital F, the little, the, the mapping small f, and you've got some group K with a mapping from X to capital K by, by a little K. And you want to show that you can get to K by going first to X and to F and then F by phi to K. Um, what you do in this abstract proof is forget about all the stuff in the middle. What you've got is X a mapping little F across to F, a little mapping across to K by a little K and a bunch of arrows going by some intermediaries from F to K. So what you do in effect is produce that original diagram, but with these in, in between steps, you, you, you generate all of these other things and show that there are GB is isomorphic to F and it has a mapping from X to that. Then there's G sub alpha, which has is, is also isomorphic and, and so on and so forth. So you get the mapping that you want via these intermediaries. So it's very much like uh, the 12 hour clock kind of proof that I mentioned earlier, right? You can prove that the 12 hour clock is a group by doing it directly, proving that it satisfies the axioms or proving that it satisfies something else that you already know to be a group. So you do the sort of indirect proof. That's what's going on here. Which is the more explanatory? Saunders McLean, the mathematician, notes that one of the applications of category theory representability theorem is that it facilitates a neat category theory proof of the free group theorem. Ours is, to be, to be clear, what we were looking at this um, abstract proof is not the category theory proof, but it's very similar. Uh, I, I suspect that a lot of the virtues carry over, um, but it's certainly at an abstract level in the same sort of way as the category theory proof is, is at a very abstract level. So McLean is talking about the category theory proof, but as far as I'm concerned, he could be talking about this second proof that we were dealing with. Um, it facilitates a neat category theory proof of the free group theorem and this is a quote from McLean, without entering into the usual rather fussy explicit construction of the elements of the free group on X as equivalence classes of words in letters of X, were, sorry, as equivalence classes of words in letters of X. So that sort of group theory stuff, the direct constructive proof, building it out of Lego, you, you know, you imagine someone saying, yeah, it's, you build it directly rather than mucking around with all those little Lego blocks, right? <laughs> rather than worrying about the little pieces you can do this by this high level category theory result. So McLean is clearly in favor of the more abstract proofs being the more explanatory, or at least in this case, the more abstract proofs such as the category theory proof and the um, abstract proof that we presented that we spent time on. 
Others speak informally of the category theory proof producing the group in question by magic. And th this I found fascinating. Th they didn't mean that it was somehow shonky or was not a proof. It's just that it was utterly opaque where this group came from. You're sure that it exists because it's a proof and the proof assures you that the group exists, but it seems to them completely opaque where it came from. Um, so we take this conflict amongst mathematicians very seriously. And, and I should say, just to, you might, might be thinking the following, well, maybe it's the category theorists that think the category theory proof is, is explanatory and the group theorists think that the group theory proof is explanatory and they don't understand each other's work or something like that. That's not the case here. Um, I, I didn't actually quiz them all about their specialties in mathematics, but those who were critical of the category theory proof clearly understood the category theory proof and knew how it worked. They just did not think that it was explanatory. So it was not like a complete ignorance of category theory or, or, or the like. And certainly if you're doing category theory, you know enough about group theory to understand that proof. It's not like they didn't get it. So I don't think anything like that's going on. I think this is a genuine clash of intuitions amongst well-trained mathematicians about an important um, result in advanced mathematics. So our tentative and somewhat unsatisfying from my point of view conclusion is that there are two quite distinct notions of explanation in operation in mathematics. The sort of structural holistic notion and something much more local intrinsic kind of relevant notion. So the um, going back to the Fermat's little theorem, the number theory proof, I think of as kind of like an intrinsic, it's local. It's about proving a number theory result using only the resources that are sort of immediately in front of you, stuff about numbers. And relevant in the colloquial sense here, although I, I am tempted by thought of relevance logic, um, shedding some light on this, maybe Lloyd or Chris can, can uh, help me with that, but the, I'm using relevance for the moment just in this sort of folk sense. Numbers are relevant to results about numbers, whereas it's not obvious that categories or groups are relevant in that same sense to results about numbers. But there is this sort of higher level, this sort of structural property. And remember what we've, with the group theory proof of Fermat's little theorem, what we end up showing was that of course Fermat's little theorem holds because it's a special case of something much more general. So in fact, if you're looking at the local details of the, the number theory, you're missing what's really the reason. The reason is something much bigger. It's the, it's the anything that has those structural properties will have this sort of result. And so this is just a special case. And that's a kind of explanation, you know? Um, so relevance, better to look at the details of the proof rather than the structure in determining whether the proof is explanatory. But what details are we looking here for here? And one suggestion from the last example is that the proof needs to be relevant to the theorem in question. This is what, again, number theorists inclined to call elementary proofs. Um, the proof of a number theory result proceeds only by number theoretic methods. So one positive proposal here is to see the relevantly valid in the technical sense, those proofs as providing explanations. And that would be kind of interesting. I, I haven't thought this through very far yet, but the thought is something like the following. You use classical logic to prove your results in mathematics and the theorem stands if it's classically valid. And if you also have a relevantly valid proof of that result, then the relevance, because you've got variable sharing and so on and so forth, that's going to count as explanatory in this relevance sense of explanatory. Um, and this may be the reason that number theorists prefer elementary proofs. So I don't think they're thinking in terms of relevance, logic or the like, but it, that, that thought that the premises of the argument are relevant to the conclusion of the argument is important to number theorists, it seems. And 
you know, we do have uh, a lot of technical expertise here on relevant logic. So maybe that's one way at least of trying to spell out what this local notion, this relevance notion of proof is. The other unification, uh, um, large scale, big picture sort of stuff, a well, a well known account sees the explanation occurring when disparate phenomena are unified under an overarching theory. So this is the, the um, uh, Friedman account of unification as explanation. So proofs that connect apparently disparate areas of mathematics and unify them in an appropriate sense will be explanatory while others will not. So for example, there are various proofs in number theory of number theory results that involve complex analysis. Now, as I noted, they're the sort of results that number theorists um, are not entirely happy with. But maybe because they're thinking in this local way, if they were sort of to think more about unification as a theory of explanation, they might change their minds about that. Um, and certainly in other areas of mathematics, this is appreciated as a, as a virtue, um, whether it's an explanatory virtue or not is, is debatable. And this might account for why things like the Riemann hypothesis um, is arguably the most outstanding unsolved problem in mathematics. It just connects up so much of mathematics um, in important, really deep and important ways. Um, and it's hard to spell that out in terms of that sort of local notion of explanation, but you might be able to spell that out in this in a unification account. Um, so one thing to say about the unification account is it's very unpopular in philosophy of science these days. So well-known counterexamples to the unification account. It was, um, I guess its heyday was back in the eighties and the philosophers of science amongst you might be able to um, tell me whether there's been any recent revivals of it, but it does look like a very promising account for mathematics. And that's kind of, worrying as well if it looks like it's a good account for at least this style of explanation in mathematics but it's been completely refuted by philosophers of science as a as a an account of explanation in science then again we're back to this you know different stories for different areas one, one account of explanation for mathematics another for science um, but it, i do know that it is a, a very unpopular view in philosophy of science circles these days and for, for pretty good reasons too, as I understand it at least. So to wrap things up, it, both this relevance and unification have something to be said in favor of them, I think, um, but they pull in different directions. Relevance is a local intrinsic explanation. Unification is a global structural explanation. Both seem to have their place in mathematical practice. And uh, I'm inclined to take that seriously and think that there may well be two quite different notions of explanation functioning in mathematics. And perhaps these two flavors of explanation coexist in mathematics, just as some think causal explanation and unification explanation coexist in empirical science. So have been, have there, been, there have been debates in philosophy of science literature on whether you want some kind of local account of, of causal uh, accounts of explanation, you know, um, as our old colleague Phil Dow would put it, this conserved quantity views, for instance, or whether you're looking for something much more global, sort of higher level explanations, and be it unification, the actual unification account or something like it, and that there does seem to be this conflict in science as well. So maybe what we're seeing in mathematics in these sorts of examples that I've presented, and I'm kind of working on others at the moment, seem to have similar kind of story to be told about them. Maybe that's just the same sort of thing that we're seeing in philosophy of science. So it, perhaps it shouldn't be all that surprising. But still, we kind of hold out hope that will be one unified account of explanation. But uh, am I, you know, I'm starting to uh, lose a little of, little of the hope on that one. Thanks very much. Thank you. Okay, one sec. Stop recording. All right. <laughs>